Well, we're in 2 Samuel 21 this morning. The book of 2 Samuel in the Old Testament, chapter 21. As you're turning there, let me ask you to think about a question. What comes to mind when you hear the name Richard Nixon? Watergate? The infamous, infamous I'm not a crook line? What comes to mind when you hear the name Harry S. Truman? Perhaps World War II? The atomic bombs? What comes to mind when you hear John F. Kennedy? Maybe Dealey Plaza? Civil rights? Cuban Missile Crisis? The affairs? And what comes to mind when you hear King David? The Bathsheba affair? The sweet psalmist? Maybe Psalm 23 comes to mind, if that's your favorite psalm. Maybe him slaying Goliath. That's what you think of first. Well, we've been studying the life of King David in the book of 2 Samuel for some time now, and we're coming close to the end, just two more sermons after this Sunday's. And the story of King David has been a bit of a roller coaster ride, hasn't it? There are very big highs, there are very deep lows, there are quick turns in the story. It's exhilarating, it's sometimes nauseating. When you get off a roller coaster, someone might ask you, so how was it? Maybe someone you even rode the roller coaster with. You, you get off together and you compare notes. What'd you think? So what do we say after this roller coaster ride, the life of King David? What do you think? What do you conclude? What do you make of this? Well, that's what the last four chapters of 2 Samuel do. 2 Samuel 21 to 24. Those chapters give us a conclusion. Not by telling us about the end of David's life. That's actually in 1 Kings 1 and 2, if you want to read that. But here, these four chapters at the end of 2 Samuel give us six previously unseen snapshots from various points in David's life. They're not in chronological order. In some cases, we have no idea when they happened. But they are deliberate in what they're communicating, telling us what to conclude and how to think about this king and his kingdom. You can see how deliberate the ending of 2 Samuel is from the structure of it all. The six snapshots in chapters 21 to 24 form what is called a chiasm in literature. A chiasm. If you're not familiar with what a chiasm is, never mind. Uh, it might be easier to think of it in terms of concentric circles with like stories, similar stories, on opposite ends of any one of these three concentric circles. Look down in your Bibles. Let me briefly show you this as you just glance down at the, the chapters as a whole. You see the be beginning and end of the outermost part of this conclusion? We have two famine stories. Chapter 21, verses 1 to 14, is a famine story. Chapter 24, David's census, leads to another famine in the land. Moving inward slightly more, you have two accounts of David's mighty men. Chapter 21, verse 15 and following, and then chapter 23, verse 6 and following. Mighty men. And then right there in the middle, we have two praise songs written by the king, David. Chapter 22 is one, and chapter 23, the first seven verses, is another. So you see the pattern? That's a chiasm. It's all very deliberate. So the ending of 2 Samuel, unlike some liberal scholars used to say many years ago, not many do today, rather than think of 2 Samuel as a handful of leftover stories that a sloppy editor didn't know what to do with or where to put, so he put them here like an appendix at the end. Instead, we should think 
This is an unusual kind of conclusion, a summary. It tells us how to think about the life of David by giving us six snapshots or vignettes from his life. We'll look at the first two stories today in chapter 21. There's one about famine, and the other is about Philistines. Like last week, also this week, we'll focus primarily on the first story today, and then we'll just cruise through the second story. There's just more to deal with in the first story. The second story is pretty straightforward, except for the fact that there are lots of giants, and one of them has six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. We'll get to that later, though. Let's read the first scene, what we might call paying for sins. Paying for sins. Verse 1 of chapter 21 Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, There's blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. And David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, It's not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, What do you say I shall do for you? They said to the king, The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel, let seven of his sons be given to us so that we may hang them before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Ritzpah, the daughter of Ai, whom she bore to Saul, Armani, and Mephibosheth, a different Mephibosheth, And the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholothite. And he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord. And the seven of them perished together, and they were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of barley harvest. Then Ritzpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. From the beginning of harvest until the rain fell upon them from the heavens. And she did not allow the birds of the air to come upon them by day or the beasts of the field by night. When David was told what Ritzpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Sham where the Philistines had hanged them. On the day, the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. And he brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who were hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin in Zela, in the tomb of Kish his father. And they did all that the king commanded. And after that, God responded to the plea for the land. Paying for sins. In both of these scenes, the one we read and the one we have not yet read, we'll consider the problem, the solution, and the significance. And I'll suggest a sentence for each of those if you're a note taker. What's the problem with this first story? (laughs) The problems are too many to list, aren't they? It poses lots of problems for modern readers and will Try to deal with those in due course. But let's start with the problem that's happening in the text itself. That God brought a famine because of Saul's sin. That's the problem. God brought a famine because of Saul's sin. Now, we're not sure when this was. There's no three-year famine other than this one mentioned earlier in the book of Samuel. We know it was sometime after Mephibosheth was blessed by David... That's 2 Samuel 9, because Mephibosheth is with David here in this chapter. 
But even if this is the only place where it's mentioned, here it is. It's in Holy Writ. At some point in David's reign, there was a three-year famine in the land. In fact, notice the dramatic way it's written in verse 1. A famine for three years, year after year. It is difficult for us 21st century Americans to fully comprehend what that would look like, what that would mean. A three-year famine? This would put you and your family and your people on the verge of extinction. It wouldn't mean that occasionally the the pantry's a little bare and you can go to grandma's house for dinner that night and she'll always cook for you. It didn't mean that the grocery store shelves were occasionally skimpy. It didn't mean that you moved down to Bosky Farms with some relatives who had a farm and there there was moisture and hence crops and food. It meant that people died a horrible, slow death. It meant that you could die. It meant that people packed up and moved away. Maybe they moved far away to Egypt. They fled. They retreated. And they retreated from the promised land. That land that once was said to flow with milk and honey. That's its moniker in the Bible. And here it flows with dirt and dryness and barrenness. And what's worse is that this wasn't a mere natural disaster. It wasn't bad luck. It isn't just the way it goes here in this topsy-turvy earth that we live on. This was God's doing. This was God's doing. David sought the face of the Lord, and the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. Once again, here we get information that we haven't gotten previously in 1st or 2nd Samuel. There's no record of a campaign of Saul against the Gibeonites, but here we have it. At some point in Saul's reign, he began to systematically obliterate the Gibeonites. That's what the Gibeonites tell David in verse 5. Saul consumed us and planned to destroy us, to wipe them out altogether. You might think, well, what's a big deal? Saul killed lots of people. David killed more. And they seem to go after these people groups with ites at the end of their name. These are one of the ites, right? What's the problem? Well, the narrator gives us information in verse 2. The Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, And although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them in Joshua 9, now Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel. Joshua 9, that story there of the Gibeonites' survival is such a fascinating one. It's not long after the Israelites had crossed the Jordan and entered the promised land with the command from God to destroy all the Canaanites those wicked people there. And the Gibeonites were Canaanites. They lived in Cana. And they heard that Israel was coming. They feared for their lives. They had heard about what God had done in Egypt and since Egypt. And so they pulled a slick move to protect themselves. They showed up to the Israelites looking all haggard, worn out, clothes torn, like they had come from very far away. Food was low, water was out. And they said they wanted to side with the Israelites and they wanted to follow Israel's God and and they wanted to make a covenant of peace with them. And they stressed over and over, we came from really far away. And Israel said, okay, let's make a peace agreement. It's a covenant, an oath. Three days later, the Israelites found out that these jokers live around the block, and they're Canaanites, but the Israelites had already agreed. Peace. So what now? 
Well, they held to the oath. For hundreds of years, the Gibeonites lived in the midst of the Israelites, not as Israelites per se, but within them and at peace. It had to be that way. They had made a covenant in the name of the Lord. The Israelites had made a covenant. And to break that covenant was to besmirch the name of the Lord. It was to imply that God's word is no good. It was to take his name in vain. In these days, to cut a covenant meant that you cut an animal in two. And the two parties of the covenant were implying, even contractually agreeing, to the fact that if I don't hold up to my end of the bargain here, may I be like this, torn in two and cursed. So that's why Saul's attempted extermination of the Gibeonites was so serious. They were under covenantal protection And Saul was breaking that covenant. He was taking the curse of God upon himself and his people. He was besmirching the testimony of the name of the Lord. So now in 2 Samuel 21, we don't know how much later, sometime after Saul's death, a later generation was having to deal with the curse that Saul brought on the land. And so David sought the Lord And David heard from the Lord. And that is mercy, isn't it? He sought the Lord and he heard from the Lord. In this dry and dirty chapter that's about to get more bloody, that that goes against every natural sensibility that we fallen sinners have, in this chapter, right up front, we see the mercy of God. The kindness that he hears, the kindness that he speaks. Ralph Davis, an Old Testament scholar, tells of an ancient pagan text called The Prayer to Every God. In it, a suffering man prays to all the gods that he can think of, all the ones he knows about. He prays to all the gods he doesn't know about because he doesn't know which god he might have offended. And he doesn't know what he might have done to offend any one of them. And he doesn't know what gods he doesn't know about. But David sought the Lord, the true God, Yahweh. And the Lord told him. What the Lord told him wasn't everything. But it was enough. It was enough. It was enough for David to know that God wasn't punishing innocent people with this famine. He was honoring his name, honoring his word. When Saul sinned, he wasn't sinning as an individual. He was sinning as king and federal representative. He brought the curse upon all the land. So the nation was bearing this curse because innocent blood was crying out From the ground. You see, this God, the biblical God, far from being a capricious, mysterious God, he's true to his word. Not least his word to protect the little guys, the marginalized. God was mad because Gibeonites were killed. Think about it, it would have been a bloodbath. Thousands of Gibeonites slain, slid open, their streets running with blood. Men, women, children crippled. It matters not. Saul was bent on their extermination. So, where's the justice? Where's the reckoning? Do you want a God who never shows up to deal with injustice? Do you want a God whose promises for peace can last eh, 400 years or so, but then be turned over by some despot, some tyrant like Saul? 
For us today, the Lord may not reveal to us why this or that thing happened. Hurricanes, earthquakes, famines, a murder, a car crash, job loss. No, what David got by word from the Lord, we don't always get. And it's not always wise. It's not wise to guess why God did something to know what he was up to, and to speak for him. We shouldn't do that. But we should remember that we have the same God. We have the same God who spoke to David. And what mercy it is. The Lord already has spoken to us about our problem, sin. He's already told us what is right What is wrong? He's told us that we're not right by nature. He's told us that something has to be done. Even more, he has told us what he has done. But back to David. There's the problem of the famine. There's the problem of Saul's blood guilt in the land. But there's also the problem of what to do about it. So David calls the Gibeonites and asks them, verse 3, What shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement? That rich theological word, atonement, is popping up here? I mean, that has to do with sacrifices. The word atonement means covering. It means satisfaction. It was a picture of blood covering sins, washing them away. So David was asking, how can Saul's guilt be covered How can sin find satisfaction? How can God's judgment be appeased or quenched or satisfied? The Gibeonite answer is great. They say, it's not a matter of silver or gold with us, as if some more change in our pockets would make this go away or or be just. No, we can't be bought. And it's not our place to take life. We won't take life. They recognize David as the king in their land. David is the judge. There's a way for justice to be met. There is a judicial process. And yet, with some prodding, David asks more for them, and they offer it. They propose, in verse 6, this to the king. Let seven of Saul's sons be given to us so that we may hang them, literally impale them. Before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul. And the king said, I will give them. That's the problem. Secondly, there's the solution. Here it is. Seven sons of Saul atone for guilt through death. Seven sons of Saul atone for guilt through their execution. It doesn't seem like a solution. We might think, isn't this just one injustice being met with another injustice? Isn't this paying for the murder of the innocent by murdering the innocent? I came across a New York Times article not too long ago that combined two of my favorite things. Hockey and the Old Testament. And because it addressed a few of my favorite things, I I had a jealousy that the author get them right, represent them. And he didn't. He said, hockey has always been the most Old Testament-like of sports. The only one with its own code of vengeance and retribution, where eye-for-eye justice is meted out by large, short-tempered men hired expressly for that purpose. Well, he's pretty right about hockey. That, that's pretty close, actually. Uh, but, but that's not the Old Testament. And yet that's the common perception that people have of the Old Testament. And our passage is one that doesn't seem to help that perception one bit. Not only does the passage propose seven men be executed and give us David's agreement of it, but then it goes on to describe the execution vividly. It's dripping with sadness and gore in verse 9. David gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites and they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord. 
and seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, the days when there should be harvest, but there was famine in the land. Seven men going up to a mountain to be hung on wood before the Lord. The innocent bearing a curse for the nation. They suffered because of the sins of their father and grandfather. And it doesn't seem right. We're human to acknowledge the fact that that doesn't seem right. Oh, we can say things like, well, seven is a number of completion. And so here you have seven of them because, well, it needs a complete sacrifice and payment. You can say things like, Saul, the murderer, was already dead, and so he can't be punished. And so you need to punish someone who's like him, sons of Saul. But that doesn't wipe the blood away. That doesn't get these seven men down. We would like to have a neater, cleaner explanation for all this. We would like there to be a better, less costly, less violent, cleaner more happy solution than this one. But sin is just that heinous. Guilt is this costly. The problem is this great and more. The curse is this relentless and strong. We want to look away from this near crucifixion-like scene. And instead, we need to give it a good, long look. We need to recall how bloody the old covenant was, not just here in 2 Samuel 21 or back in Gibeah, but in Leviticus and in the temple, in those sacrifices, day by day and year after year, a religion where the priests functioned as much like butchers as anything else. Atonement has been gruesome since day one. The problem of sin is so great that famine doesn't hold a match to it. And the substitutionary execution of these seven Saul, sons of Saul is but a flicker of the horror of the actual solution that's needed in the end. But before we can get to that, we can't leave this mountain yet. We can't leave the mountain of execution because the passage will not let us turn away yet. It makes us stay with Ritzpah. Verses 10 to 14. Ritzpah, she's the mother of two of the slain men. She stays with the slain bodies. She shoes the birds. She, she chases away the beasts of the field to care for the bodies, to preserve them until they can be buried. Day and night, out in the elements, all alone, doing simply what she can. And when it seems like it can't get any unbearably sadder, we're told something about how long this might have been. From barley harvest to the usual rainy season was months. Months of this. It says she chased away the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. That phrase, birds of the air and beasts of the field, something David said when he was preaching to Goliath. You're going to be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. In fact, that phrase pops up in the later prophets describing God's final judgment, his end time wrath, the apocalypse. Ezekiel 29 to 39 would be one place you can read. 11 chapters there where there's probably 8, 9, 10 references to the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. What it means is complete desolation. No honor. No one around to support or bury. No hope fully under the judgment of God. And Ritzpah's chasing away the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. She's chasing away 
the full-blown dishonor for her sons. She's refusing for there to be not any hope in Israel. Well, did it work? Did their substitutionary execution do anything? Well, there's no mention of the famine ceasing as she sits there. And so she stays and she stays and she stays. You can't help but think of Mary, the mother of our Lord, who was there at the cross when her son was crucified. You can't help but think of the women who were with Mary, who stayed with the body until it was buried. You can't help but think of those women caring for the body of Jesus, going there early that Sunday morning, expecting simply to care for a body. It all seemed hopeless, but they did what they could. David hears of Ritzpah's vigil, and he's moved to action. We don't know why David didn't give these men a proper burial earlier than this. We're just not told. But he's impressed by her courage and her care for the bodies. And so David not only wants to care for these seven, but he also is reminded of the fact that Saul and Jonathan were buried one day back in 2 Samuel 1 in sort of a rush fashion. They're put in a kind of odd place. It was makeshift. And so David, he buries them all together in a proper place. The seven sons of Saul with their father and Jonathan now buried in the tomb of Saul's father. And after that, verse 14 says, it was after that God responded to the plea for the land. Rain, crops, food. Life, curse removed. What's the significance of all this? Well, let's start with David. The significance, for one, is that David is a better king. Better than who? He's better than Saul. This is a story of two kings, isn't it? Even though there's only one alive at the time. But it keeps contrasting these two kings. Saul was an oath breaker. And David was an oath keeper. Did you catch that in verse 7 when Mephibosheth is mentioned? You know, sons of Saul have to die. And Mephibosheth is a son of Saul. And David had already made an oath with Mephibosheth that he wouldn't die, but it would really go well for him. And so David brings justice to the land. He quenches the blood guilt. And he also keeps the oath that he made to Mephibosheth. David is a God-seeking king who hears from God, unlike Saul. David is the better king. Now the story of Saul can be fully put to bed. It can be buried. Because it is. He's buried. David is the king after God's own heart. He seeks the Lord. He rules in righteousness and equity. He is God's agent at this time for righting wrongs, even for removing curses, restoring the land, feeding the people. He is the shepherd of Israel. And yet, let's not get carried away. This guy doesn't walk on water. He doesn't even do proper burials very well. He can't remove the curse himself. And that's why the more significant thing about this story is what it tells us about God and how he works. It tells us guilt can be atoned for through a substitute. Guilt can be atoned for through a substitute. God used David in the story to tell us more about God, not David. And here God showed us that sin is guilt and there is curse for guilt. That there is such a thing as wrath. That God is angry about sin. And that there is a reckoning. But that God's wrath can be satisfied. Guilt can be covered. It can be atoned for. God's economy for justice allows for substitution. 
I know it doesn't work like that in our world, in our justice, in our courts. No mom can say to the judge, oh, no, no, not my son. I will go to maximum security prison for him instead. And the judge allows that. No, but be careful. Don't take our concepts of justice and then think that God must work that way. Or to think that God can't do what he just decides to do. God allows for substitute punishment and substitute rewards. That's what the sacrificial system of the Old Testament was teaching day after day after day, year after year. You can put your hand to this animal and transfer your sins. It was just a picture, but it pointed ahead. We see a picture again in these seven slain there on Mount Gibeah. It was all pointing ahead to the day when there would be another son of David on a mount before the Lord for the sins of the people. You think the death of these seven is gruesome and sad and horrible and unbearable? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, to tremble. Do not look away from Golgotha, the place of the skull where our Savior hung. Jesus, upon the cross there, was not just bearing the sin of one murderer, but bearing the sins of a multitude which no man can number from every tongue and tribe and kindred and nation. He was bearing the sins of any and all who would ever call on him, confess him, and cling to him. Listen to how Paul, the apostle, explains all this in Romans 5. He says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus through whom we have now received reconciliation. Or as he wrote in Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For as it says in the Old Testament, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus quenched the curse. He bore the wrath. The Gettys have taught us to sing this gift of love in righteousness, scorned by those he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here, in the love of Christ, I live. And we know that the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross was a payment that was received in full because he was buried, not without hope, but as he said he would do, he was raised on the third day. He died for all. That those who live may no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised. He died for them. We get some gospel glimpses in 2 Samuel 21. But let it speak to you by what is missing here. Can you imagine if the Gibeonites proposed to King David that seven sons of Saul would satisfy the guilt and David instead said, No, no, that that, that ain't right. Right? I'll go. Me. You hang me. 
I'm not guilty. I'm not even a son of Saul. But I'm the king. I will lay down my life for my people. They need to eat. I will die so that they will live. Well, that's what Jesus did. And more. His stoop from throne to cross was infinitely greater than any stoop sacrifice that King David could have made for his people. Because Jesus is the real better king. He's the best king. He's the final king. He is both king and sacrifice. Do you believe that? Do you believe what the Bible says about you to be true? About what the Bible says of the human condition to be true? Do you believe it? Do you believe what this Bible says about who Jesus is and what he came to do and and what he did do? And have you yet believed that he did it for you? Have you come to believe that? It almost feels unthinkable. And we Christians, we sometimes forget that it's unthinkable. Christian, let us believe that the Savior did it for you, but let us marvel. Let us say, can he? Would he? Did he really? Charles Wesley was so good in his hymnody about marveling like this, using questions to praise God. Can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? In his hymn, Depth of Mercy, he wrote, Depth of mercy, can there be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear? Me, the chief of sinners, spare? I have long withstood him, withstood his grace. I've long provoked him to his face. I wouldn't hearken to his calls. I grieved him by a thousand falls. But Jesus speaks and pleads his blood. He disarms the wrath of God. Now my Father's mercies move. Justice lingers into love. There for me the Savior stands. He shows his wounds and spreads his hands. God is love. I know. I feel. Jesus weeps and loves me still. I'd like to linger longer with you at Golgotha. But one more scene in 2 Samuel 21 beckons to us today. As I said, much more quickly, let's hit the gas pedal on scene two, which we might call defeating the enemy. Verse 15, there was war again between the Philistines and Israel. And David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines. And David grew weary. And Ishbi Benab, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze and who was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. And David's men swore to him, You shall no longer go out with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. After this, there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sebekai the Hushathite, struck down Saf, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhanan, the son of Yar-Oregim, the Bethlehemite, he struck down Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was again war at Gath. And there was a man of great stature, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. And he was also descended from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shammai, David's brother, struck him down. These four were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Defeating the enemy. What's the problem in this story? Well, it begins with the enemy being big. And the king is old and weary. 
The enemy is big, the king. He's weary. He's likely also old because his men say to him, you shall no longer go out to us in battle. That sounds permanent. He's weary. And he's old. Though David was that great warrior king who had slain his ten thousands, he was not omnipotent and he was not eternal. He was now old and weary. And yet the enemy still remains. The Philistines were a constant threat to Israel. David may have famously defeated that giant Philistine Goliath before, yet now later there are more of his kind. The passage speaks of four giants. One is actually called Goliath the Gittite. Did you notice that? And you may have noticed too that it, it says Ethanon was the one who struck down Goliath the Gittite. That's not an error in our Bibles, like 1 Samuel 17, David killing Goliath is either wrong or this is wrong, that Ethanon has struck down Goliath the Gittite. There could be two Goliaths. There must have been. They could be brothers. Goliath may have been a title. Even today, we speak of, that guy's a real Goliath. Sort of a title. It's not anyone's name. But regardless, the threat is big. There are four battles. There was war again. There was war again. Four giants. One with 24 digits. How weird is that? My son asked me this week, it was after we read this, Dad, is that real? That doesn't sound real because, you know, a six-fingered guy is weird enough. That's in the movies. This is every extremity. Yeah, but there are weirder things than this in the Bible, right? If you believe in the resurrection, you can believe that some guys can be really tall and have an extra digit on each part of their limbs. And he taunted Israel. He blasphemed the God of Israel. Just like his forefather Goliath did that day. Remember how? The Philistine cursed David by his gods and how David responded to that giant Goliath back when he was just a shepherd boy, how he defended the name of the Lord, how he said, God will give you into my hands this day and you will be food for the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, for you will know and these people will know, those people will know the battle is the Lord's and he wins, not with spear or sword, the battle is the Lord's. Remember, on that day, when the first giant Goliath fell, David was the only Israelite who would face that giant. But now in 2 Samuel 21, David is old. The giants have multiplied. Even their fingers and toes are multiplying. So secondly, the solution, David's mighty men will face the giants. David's mighty men will face the giants. There are four battles, four giants, and four valiant men who fought for David. They protected him. They fought for him. And they had success. And the giants fell. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. What's the significance? Well, as promised... God brought victory over the enemy. God brought victory over the enemy. God isn't mentioned in this part. Oh, but you can't miss him if you've been reading along. You can't miss him. It's subtle, but you notice the way the giant's size is emphasized. The extremities are emphasized. Weaponry is emphasized with David's men. There's no mention of their size. There's no mention of their strength. There's no mention of their weapons. That doesn't mean they didn't use a weapon, but because of that theological principle that the Lord saves, not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, the storyteller doesn't tell us anything about their swords. The battle is the Lord's. Well, that's what we're seeing in 2 Samuel 21. It's what was actually prophesied way back in 1 Samuel 2. 
in Hannah's prophetic song. She looked into the future and somehow knew that God was about to thunder against his enemies and he will protect his anointed. He'll give strength to his king. He'll exalt the horn of his anointed. And that's exactly what's coming to pass. Sometimes God would advance his kingdom through David the king, but because David was not eternal, not omnipotent, he needed others. David getting old and weary proves that he is not the final resting point for this kingdom. The baton's being passed. And that's a good thing. Remember in David's lifetime, Israel's army went from being chicken-hearted up there on the mountain, not wanting to go down and face that first Goliath. David was the only one. To now here in 2 Samuel 21, David is old and weary, and there are plenty of mighty men, and they can drop giants like David did as well. Because David's important, but David is not irreplaceable. The baton keeps getting passed, and it kept getting passed from king to king to king to king, some better, some worse, until the last king of David eventually came and at him the baton would stop. At him the scepter would rest. And it has been there in his hand ever since. He reigns. And he shall reign forever and ever. Because he came to die. He died too, like his great, 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 great grandfather David who died. But David... Sorry, Jesus didn't die in defeat or of old age. He he died in order to defeat. Jesus didn't come to defeat Philistines. He came to defeat and conquer the giants of sin and Satan, death and the curse. And the only way to have victory over those is to go through death. Jesus said... You can't rob a strong man unless you first bind him up in his house and then you can go and you plunder his goods. And that's what Jesus did to Satan. He came and he bound him and he plundered his goods and we're proof of that. We are those who have been moved out of one kingdom of darkness, transferred into a kingdom of his marvelous light. And thanks be to God We have victory through Jesus Christ. And so now we don't have to be afraid of any giants, no matter how many fingers or toes they have, no matter how weird they look. Jesus defeated all the giants. Everything else, by comparison, is puny. And he's coming again to finish what he started. Who will separate us from the love of Christ that's coming to us when he returns? Nothing. Nothing will separate us. No one will separate us. No, in all these trials, all these worries, all these possible threats, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, because you love us, And because you have conquered and because you are conquering, we believe you are coming again. We thank you for that. What great hope that is. Help us this morning as Christians to be encouraged and to give you praise for what you have done, for who you are, for what you will do, and for how you will reveal yourself to us more and more in days ahead and especially at your return. Help us to give you praise as we sing now, to sing about your return, to sing about the coming king, and to thank you for being our king, the sacrificed king. We thank you. Amen.